Good morning and welcome to the 22nd meeting in 2015 of the Health and Sport Committee. I'm going to ask everyone in the room, as I usually do at this point, to switch off mobile phones as they can often interfere with the sound system. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll point out for those who haven't been with us in the past that um, uh, you will see um, officials and members using tablet devices um, and this is in instead of the hard copies of the papers. Um, we have apologies this morning from Nanette Millen um, uh, for, for the record. Um, our first item on the agenda today is whether to agree to take item 7, a draft stage 1 report on Care of Scotland Bill in private uh, and uh, in private uh, uh, in, at future meetings. Um, the committee is, all, uh, is also invited to agree to take uh, the NHS Board's budget scrutiny draft report in private at future meetings. Um, can uh, I have the committee's agreement that that would be the case? Agree, Thank yes. you. We now move to uh, agenda item number two, um, health, tobacco, nicotine, etc. Care, Scotland Bill, um, uh, witnesses expenses. And can I ask the members that they agree to delegate that onerous responsibility to me uh, to, 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 to arrange for... Uh, for uh, when it is necessary for the SPCB to pay uh, those expenses under Rule 12.43. Um, uh, can, we, can we have the committee's agreement on that? Thank you. Thank you. We now move to agenda item number three, um, uh, which, uh, of course, is our first evidence session of the Health Tobacco, uh, Health Tobacco, Nicotine, etc. and Care Scotland Bill. And can I welcome um, uh, to the committee Sheila Duffy, uh, Chief Executive of Ash Scotland, Scottish Coalition of Tobacco. Thank you for your attendance this morning. Professor Linda Bald, um, Professor of Health Policy, University of Stirling. And Simon Clark, Director of Freedom Organisation for the Right to Enjoy Smoking Tobacco Forest. Uh, and Andy Morrison, Trustee, New Nicotine Alliance. Welcome to you all. Uh, I haven't had any notification that we're going to make any presentation, so can we move to the first question uh, and, 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 and take it from there? And I've got my first question from a committee member this morning, Richard Lyon, to get us started. Thank you, Kandira. Uh, a number of months ago, I was able to uh, convince the committee to have a, a morning session on uh, um, the NVPs, which are is nicotine vapour products. Uh, what is your feeling on the suggestion that we look at um, ensuring that these are not sold to children and that they put a, an age limit on it? And what is your uh, um, opinion on the factor of advertising? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the question. I think there's almost universal acceptance that we need age restriction on nicotine-containing products in terms of the responses to the consultation on this bill, but also to bring Scotland in line with the rest of the UK that have committed to uh, introducing an age of sale limit of 18. Um, there isn't really any reason why a never-smoking child who's never used a nicotine product should start using nicotine. So I think even amongst uh, the smoking and vaping community, we see strong support for age of sale. So that's the first point. The second point is advertising, which is more difficult. Um, my own view, I spent 17 years doing research on smoking cessation, helping people stop smoking, is that we still need some forms of e-cigarette advertising to, include, to encourage current smokers to switch to less harmful products. But I think the team who've drafted this bill have tried to strike a balance, still allowing point of sale, marketing or advertising, while restricting some of the other channels that are not going to be covered by European legislation and might appeal to children. So we may have a longer discussion on that, but those are my uh, starting thoughts on those two questions. Yeah, I'll back that up as well. Uh, what Linda's saying there, we, we don't want to see under-18s picking up these devices. However, we do have several issues with advertising. We feel that uh, we shouldn't stifle the advertising too much. We want responsible advertising to basically um, help fight against the tobacco products. We want to give e-cigarettes the leading edge over tobacco products and therefore would welcome the allowance of uh, responsible advertising. Anyone else? 
Uh, yes, I would just say again, like the other speakers, uh, we'd be opposed to excessive restrictions on advertising free cigarettes. Uh, it makes sense to encourage people to switch from combustible cigarettes to electronic cigarettes, and uh, as long as people aren't forced to do so. And therefore, it seems to be counterproductive if you make those regulations in advertising and marketing too restrictive. In terms of uh, age of sale, uh, yes, clearly they should be restricted. I think there is perhaps an argument to be had as to whether that uh, restrict restriction should be 16 or 18. Up until a few months ago, we were firmly of the opinion it should be 18. But as the uh, more and more evidence comes to the fore, uh, we've seen in recent weeks, Public Health England, uh, the Royal Society of Public Health, saying that uh, clearly e-cigarettes um, are a lot less potentially harmful than combustible cigarettes. It might be quite a uh, courageous stance for the Scottish Government to take to actually say, well, look, we need to create a clear marker between combustibles and electronic cigarettes and actually allow people to buy them at 16. Because you're always going to get some children who are going to experiment. That's never going to be stopped. And at the moment, there are clearly a considerable number of children who experiment with uh, traditional cigarettes at the age of 16 or 17. Um, and maybe you want to make it, you know, nudge them towards e-cigarettes. There's no evidence that um, uh, e-cigarettes are a gateway to tobacco. Uh, so it's not something we would specifically support, um, uh, an age limit of 16. But I think it's worth having that discussion, because if you're allowing people to vote at 16, um, then, you know, maybe you should say, OK, they're old enough to make their own decisions about uh, nicotine at 16. Sheila. Um, we would support the age restriction uh, to 18 for consistency and because it's the international accepted age for protection. Um, I have real concerns about the advertising. I think it's legitimate to want to make smokers aware of these products and to make them aware that tobacco is, um, on some estimates, 20 times more harmful. But I think potentially advertising could become a gateway for tobacco companies to reach young people and we must watch that very carefully given their track record of exploiting advertising and marketing. This, this question is 16 and 18, you know, and the, and the growing idea that uh, harm reduction is better than smoking cigarettes. If, if it's good for somebody at 19 to help them take it off tobacco, why isn't it good for somebody at 17 to be able to ask access e-cigarettes as a, as a means of stopping smoking tobacco? I think you have to strike the balance between um, uh, trying to support young people who are already using tobacco and, and making giving access to a nicotine-containing product to children who've never smoked. So I think it is a, it's a tricky decision about 16 and 18. The reason Cancer Research UK, and that's primarily why I'm here, is on behalf of them. The reason we've supported the age of sale of 18 in our submission is, as Sheila said, largely for consistency with the rest of the UK and also internationally, where you see that though that's the age of sale limit that's commonly being um, adopted. Yeah. And also, I don't think that 16 or 18 is really the priority issue for this bill. There are other much trickier issues within it. Okay. Anyone else on that? No? Yeah. Yes. Can I move on to my other question? Uh, I'm sure Mr Clark will come in on this one. Um, in the bill is regard to smoking in hospital grounds. Um, if you go to most hospitals standing outside uh, are people having a, a cigarette. Uh, and take, for instance, my own hospital near me, Wisher Hospital. Um, based on the regulations that the government wants to introduce, you'd have to go outside the hospital, which would mean near enough a, a quarter uh, I've never measured it, but I would say about a quarter mile walk to the outer periphery uh, of the hospital. Um, I ab abhor um, people standing outside the, the, the hospital uh, entrance. Uh, you know, a number of years ago, we introduced the, the non-smoking in, in public places, so basically people don't smoke inside buildings. Outside the building, uh, there, would you agree, Mr Clark, that based on, I know it's on your... Um, what you've submitted. Would you agree or would you suggest that whilst you agree that maybe smoking outside the building is wrong, that maybe 100 to 200 yards away there should be some form of shelter or whatever uh, in order that people could go to an area to smoke? Because at the end of the day there is, I believe, 20% of the population still smoke. 
um, that and and going to a hospital can be quite traumatic. You're in to see your your relation who may uh, have uh, a, a severe health problems not related to smoking, and you come out and you want to have a cigarette. So, would you uh, suggest in your submission? Would you suggest that somewhere within the hospital grounds there should be a, a shelter or something set up out with the entrance to the hospital? Well, thank you for raising that issue because it's something we feel very, very strongly about. Um, as you've said, going to hospital as a patient or a visitor can be a very stressful experience. It's also quite stressful for many members of staff. And to ban smoking on all hospital grounds, we think, is totally inhumane. It's totally vindictive. It's petty, far pettier, actually, than banning smoking in, in pubs, because at least people can still uh, go outside. Uh, I mean, we're still firmly against the current um, comprehensive smoking ban, but to extend it to the entire hospital site uh, we think is absolutely outrageous. I totally accept that when you go to a hospital, uh, having people standing around the entrance is not a, uh, a nice sight. It's not uh, particularly nice for people who are walking past them, although I do think that's often uh, exaggerated. But you've got to look at it from a patient's point of view. And if you're a patient, I'm thinking of patients who are not just in for one or two days, but patients who might be in for eight or nine weeks. That might be somebody, for example, an elderly person who's in for a, a hip replacement. They might be in hospital for eight or nine months, have very limited mobility. They're being told that they cannot go outside and smoke anywhere on the hospital grounds. And you have to, for, for a lot of those people, a lot of patients in hospital, having the odd cigarette, is, uh, there's a comfort factor there. It's something they actually look forward to. And to deny them that right to have a cigarette anywhere in hospital grounds is, is totally and utterly wrong. I think it's going to be quite expensive to enforce. Um, we've read newspaper reports in recent months in Scotland of uh, a lot of people simply ignoring um, smoking bans on hospital grounds. But that's fine for people who are mobile and can go outside. But what about people who are immobile? I had a call recently from the daughter of a woman, age 67, suffering from dementia, who was at a psychiatric hospital in Edinburgh. And uh, she was, lots of other patients were able to go outside, but because she was suffering from dementia, she couldn't go out on her own. Uh, it was unsafe. And the staff were being threatened with disciplinary action if they took pity on her and took her outside. There's a long history of staff taking people outside so they can have a smoke. That's what they want to do. But now those same staff are being threatened with a disciplinary action. So you might have somebody who has a fantastic record of 20, 30 years working for the NHS who could find themselves uh, penalised in some way, maybe even lose their job because they've taken pity on a patient, taken them outside for a smoke. That has to be wrong. Just going back to your specific point, yes, I don't see why hospitals can't have smoking shelters. But if they turn around and say, well, we can't actually afford them, I would say, well, what is wrong with, as you say, smoking 100 yards away from the building? I wouldn't put a particular limit on it. I think this is something where people have to show a bit of common sense. So, yes, let's not have people smoking around the entrance, but anywhere else on hospital grounds, for heaven's sake, they're not putting anybody else's health at risk by lighting a cigarette in the open air. Why should they be forced off hospital grounds, having to walk, as you say, a quarter of a mile, perhaps onto a busy main road? And one uh, item we put into our submission, which I totally accept is an isolated case, but um, about eight years ago, uh, there was a nurse who, in, in, I believe it was a hospital in Essex, who was forced off hospital grounds to have a smoke, and she was murdered. Now, I'm not saying that that is going to be a regular occurrence, but I think it's something that we have to bear in mind, that you are putting people potentially at risk by forcing them further and further away from hospital grounds just to light a cigarette in the open air. I think it's totally wrong, and as I say, I think it's totally and utterly inhumane, and it goes against the so-called caring NHS. Yeah, thanks. We need to, you know, we've got limited time, and we need to be uh, concise in our questions and, and, and concise in our responses, please. Anyone else in response to the perimeter, um, uh, smoking perimeter? Sheila? Um, sorry, I should have made uh, a declaration of Scott 2015, declaration for the record that I and my organisation have no formal or informal financial or in-kind links to tobacco companies, their representatives or vested interests. Apologies for not making that first. Um, 
I would note, uh, just for the record, that dementia, um, tobacco use, smoking is a very high risk factor for all forms of dementia. Um, I think the aim in Scotland is to put tobacco out of sight, out of mind and out of fashion. And as part of that, of course, you have to be compassionate with people who are used to smoking and who may have a physical addiction. And the NHS is very good at offering all forms of support to people to try and manage that. And that's important as part of any proposed restrictions. Anyone else? I would just like to say that uh, the New Nicotine Alliance is delighted that uh, e-cigarettes have not been in the been brought into this part of the legislation. In other words, they're not going to make it a law, um, the same as cigarettes. Um, however, we are a little bit disappointed that some of the, N in fact, the majority of the NHS buildings have decided to ban e-cigarettes on their grounds, along with tobacco. Yeah, we've had some evidence about that. I mean, you know, I think there is a general consensus that the better with an e-cigarette as a, a cigarette. I mean, you know. Is this contradictory? Do people feel that it's a bit contradictory in terms of the banning e-cigarettes alongside tobacco in and around? Does it not send the wrong message? I think we, we had an evidence in the past, if you treat people with an e-cigarette the same as you would someone smoking, then you're sending the wrong message here. Does it actually um, uh, you know, harm or uh, our, our actions in trying to get people to reduce their smoking. I mean, I think the bill as it's currently drafted in relation to hospital grounds is very clear that e-cigarettes are not included in that in terms of the enforcement and the penalties that will follow with that. And I think that's absolutely right. Um, I, you know, I, I'm very clear that we shouldn't have banned e-cigarette use in NHS grounds in Scotland. I think the Health Board's decision was wrong on that because, as you say, it sends the message that, uh, that e-cigarettes are like smoking and that potentially they are as harmful as smoking. But fortunately, this bill doesn't include e-cigarettes in the grounds provisions, and I think, I think that's key. And also, just to state for the record, the bill encouragingly doesn't include any suggestions of banning e-cigarette use uniformly indoors in Scotland. In other words, it doesn't propose extending smoke-free legislation indoors to cover e-cigarettes. And again, in, cost, in contrast to Wales, that is the right decision, because we just do not have the evidence of health harm from secondhand vapour the way we did secondhand smoke. Is that a view that's supported by everyone? Are there, are there variations in that view from the witnesses here this morning? Yes. It's not agreement, but uh, we would like to see the Scottish Government work with partners to issue guidance on policies um, as appropriate for indoor use of uh, NVPs. Anyone else? Mr Clark? Uh, no, I think it would be ludicrous to ban uh, the use of e-cigarettes in, uh, in hospital grounds. The only way I think we we differ is the fact that uh, I'm also against the uh, ban on use of cigarettes on hospital grounds. Okay, Colin Keir. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, it's really actually a clarification of something that was said by Mr. Morrison uh, in the opening question, which was uh, the statement of uh, responsible advertising that you mentioned. And I'm a bit of a maybe it's just me, but how do we get a definition? of what is responsible advertising. What is it? How do we define it? I'm talking about not targeting children, um, not glamorising uh, the e-cigarette e even. Um, basically, to, to make sure it's, it's aimed at smokers. That's, and that's all. Aimed at current smokers to get them off cigarettes or to give them an opportunity to get off cigarettes. We don't want to encourage any non-smokers, whether they be children, adults, whatever. How would you go about that? Because... <sighs> This is the thing, it's all very well saying responsible yeah. advertising. It's the definition, obviously, you're trying to get around, but obviously not everybody's going to necessarily agree with no. how to do it. Uh, and this is the thing, you know, it, it's um, the one thing that sort of gets me has always been uh, how do you make sure people understand what responsible advertising is? I can't answer that question other than to say... In which case, how, do we, how could we actually accept there is... I'm certainly enjoy this conversation, but it is a <laughs> conversation. You need to allow some of the others who may wish to respond okay. to your initial question Apologies. about um, how important the, 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 um, the bill uh, sees the, the role of advertising and what its target is. 
Professor so Ball. Just to comment on that, obviously the Advertising Standards Authority has already put some restrictions in place on e-cigarette advertising and they adjudicate so people complain as you will know and they can look at the advertising and come to a decision about whether it's irresponsible or not. But I do take the point that it's difficult to differentiate whether marketing, for example, reaches a child or is a responsible advert and it only appeals to an adult. That's actually quite difficult to do. Um, and I think that's why, again, the, the team have been very careful in, in, in terms of the, this bill allowing the point-of-sale advertising to continue because you could argue that um, giving people information about the products at the point of sale um, and making uh, some effort to um, uh, continue the appeal of those products to current smokers is still needed. So removing the other forms of advertising, the giant billboards, etc., that might glamorize products, but still providing that information, some form of advertising, I think is really important. Um, so I do, I do think the bill tries to strike the right balance on this issue, very tricky issue. Anyone else? No. Well, I think with marketing and promotion, I think we have to be careful uh, that um, we don't make e-cigarettes uh, promoted purely as a medicinal product. Because the reason that e-cigarettes have been so popular with a lot of smokers is because they see them as a recreational product, not a medicinal product. It's true that uh, a lot of users are using them to cut down or quit smoking. But... There's also the, the pleasure aspect to vaping using e-cigarettes. And if you turn all e-cigarette advertising into essentially like sort of pharmaceutical advertising, uh, there's a danger that you'll actually drive a lot of potential consumers away. And you won't attract smokers because they'll see it um, as a medicinal product, which is frankly less attractive than if it's promoted um, as an attractive recreational Product. So we have to be very, very careful here. Okay. Colin, do you wish to... to no, no. Um, Mike, please, and then Richard. Thank you, convener. My question, I suppose, is more specifically for uh, Professor Bald, and I just wonder if, there, if you're aware of any evidence that cold turkey as a kind of method for cessation of smoking is uh, efficacious. Does that work? Okay, so if you look at the evidence globally, the vast majority of smokers who stop smoking do it in precisely that way. They do it unaided, it's willpower alone, and that may be because that's how they decide to do it. They're not informed about the alternatives or they're not available in some countries. But we know that that's probably the worst way to stop in terms of your chances of success. So if you look at the evidence again globally, the best way for somebody to stop smoking is a combination of two things. Using a stop smoking aid, like nicotine replacement therapy, uh, Champix, or indeed potentially e-cigarettes. And then um, having support to stop from a nurse, a doctor, somebody trained, uh, even the quit line to help them stop. If you combine those two things, our studies have shown you're about four times more likely to be successful than if you use willpower. Um, but I would say it's very important to give people choice. And if people decide that they're going to throw away their pack of cigarettes tomorrow and not touch them again, and that's the way that works for them, great. We have to give lots of roots in. Great. Can I take it then that you're not in favour of a kind of imposed cold turkey solution then? No, I mean, I again, you know, all the years I've spent in this field, I've seen for pregnant women, people with mental health problems, whatever, lots of different groups, different things work for different individuals. So we need to make sure there are as many routes out of tobacco as possible. Are you concerned about uh, aspects of this? But we need to let the other witnesses who, who, who are here not to witness our proceedings, give them an opportunity if they want to ask. Because there, there are... Uh, in, in terms of the... Apologies, the, convener. I understood that Professor Bold was the authority in this We have a panel of, of witnesses, mate. Yeah, apologies. You know, so we need to give them time if they wish. They, they, some of them are you know, looking to me want none, uh, you know, so it's, it's just to give them a full experience. Sheila, do you, you want to respond? Or anyone else want to respond? Oh, I agree with what Professor Bold said. Right. Okay. Yeah, I agree as well, but I think you'll find with electronic cigarettes, the, 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 the great thing about electronic cigarettes is the diversity of the product. It's not a one-size-fits-all, not like a nicotine patch where you slap the nicotine patch on, if it works, it works, if it doesn't, it doesn't. The same with the gum, it works, it works, it doesn't, it doesn't. Electronic cigarettes... There is so, such a vast range of these devices out there and you can mix and match and so forth and everyone will find a solution. I've not known one person come to me that's, that said, oh, I don't like these and I've not been able to change that device in some way, shape or form and within a week or so, he stopped smoking. 
So electronic cigarettes, for me, is the way to go. Is there any wider evidence on that, that in terms of the use of different type of devices? Would you like to comment on that, you, Professor? If you're happy for me to comment on that. Uh, it's a new area where we're seeing new studies published all the time. Um, we've got two, very briefly, two randomised controlled trials that, sh that show, using very old devices actually, that e-cigarettes are about as effective as a nicotine patch for stopping smoking. Those are the trials. A more recent study showing that people who stop smoking using an electronic cigarette in the UK were 60% more likely to be successful in stopping smoking than willpower alone or buying nicotine replacement therapy over the counter. And then finally, a really interesting new study which differentiates as Andy's saying, between the basic Sigalite, the ones that look like cigarettes, and what we call tank devices, later generation, that showed that the tanks were more effective in helping people to stop because they allow people to var uh, vary the amount of nicotine that's in there. They're more effective in delivering nicotine. So I do agree with Andy that the different devices have different effectiveness. And from a research perspective, actually, we need to study this in the longer term, see what works best for folk. Mike. Thank you, convener. Um, bringing it just back to the bill, um, are you concerned that there are aspects of this bill then in prohibiting um, smoking in hospital grounds, which could be seen as a kind of um, imposed cold turkey solution and that may actually engender a very negative response in terms of taking forward the agenda of encouraging people to stop through more efficacious methods? So... Is this bill running the risk of actually having a contrary purpose to that which Sheila Duffy would like to see? Smoke free Scotland by 2034 or whatever yeah. it is. I think it very much depends how you do it. I think you have to communicate with people, you have to offer them support and you have to take them with you. And that was the real success of Scotland's indoor public places legislation. Forgive me, but we've heard that, I've heard this answer before and I've read it in the written evidence. I don't quite see how that gels with saying to people, you know, we've heard some descriptions of people who are just visiting a very sick relative, they're traumatised, or somebody who's just had very bad news from their consultant or whatever, who's a, you know, a, a smoker, whose instinct is to light a cigarette to help them cope with whatever, and you're saying... Yes, we're offering you long-term cessation treatment, but you're banned from smoking for the next half a mile or whatever. I, or I'm, in terms of patients who are inpatients who are banned from smoking and absolutely prohibited from doing so with a real practical problem in terms of being able to smoke, um, but yet you're saying that you're, you really want to offer long-term mm. cessation. No, I'm talking about short-term management in terms of habit and if there's a physical addiction, that's the kind of support that we need to be offering people. But I think it is a real myth, and it's one that the tobacco companies perpetuate, that smoking relieves stress. And if you look at the research, actually there's an inverse relationship, and former smokers and never smokers report better well-being and less stress than current smokers. Well, let's leave that argument aside. What I'm, what I'm really... Right, there's, look, there's people want to answer your question. Sorry. You've got a range of people, a range of views here. They all want to participate. Sorry, uh, Convener, I was <laughs> just mindful of the fact that you've told us throughout this meeting that we're short of time. Well, you have had more than your fair share, Mr McKenzie, but we will... We will, we will, we will uh, there, there are people who on the panel who want to resp respond to your question. I think Professor that, Ball, the, the hospital grounds element of this bill is complex. Um, I think that those of us working in the field would agree that uh, having smoking in the very place where people go to get well, even if it's an outside, slightly outside the building, is not compatible with the NHS. We're spending millions of pounds trying to treat smoking-related disease. So that's the first principle. But I guess the second principle is that when you look at what we know internationally about how to make new smoke-free policies work, even if they include the grounds, they need three things. They need a good policy, they need good enforcement, and they need good communication with the public about what they're for and why it's happening. Now, those may be issues for the regulations rather than for the legislation, but I do think they're important things to keep in mind. And if we are going to go down this route, I slightly disagree with Sheila. I don't think we're actually doing enough in the NHS to offer people alternatives to help them um, deal with their nicotine withdrawal if they're forced to not be allowed to smoke, including in the grounds. I think we could do a lot more, actually, on that. Thank you.
Anyone else? I'll just repeat what I said earlier. I think it's totally wrong to ban smoking in all hospital grounds. I think it is inhumane. I understand why hospitals don't want to uh, appear to encourage people to smoke, but we're living, we've got to be pragmatic about this. We've got to live in the real world, not some utopian smoke-free world where nobody gets comfort from lighting up. The reality is, whatever Sheila says, a great many people enjoy smoking and they get comfort from it, particularly in stressful situations like hospitals. Would Professor Ball take us to the next stage? Do you believe that this bill mm -hmm. and this, you know, this process here uh, and the implementation, the expected implementation of this bill, um, confirms those three key elements that you mentioned? Um, I think there. I think that the the way the bill is drafted tries to strike the right balance. But I do think that the specifying exactly what the perimeter around the buildings is going to be, yeah. how that's enforced, all those aspects are very important. We learned that from smoke free, and I, my understanding is actually those are aspects for the regulations, the specificity of that, rather than the bill itself. So I'm pointing out that's going to be challenging. Yeah. Yeah. The enforcement as well. I and the enforcement. Yeah. I, from, from my reading, it's not clear who's going to enforce. Although I welcome this in principle, it's not clear who's going to enforce this extension of smoke-free. There really shouldn't be a one-size-fits-all uh, regulation on smoking outside because uh, NHS hospital grounds vary enormously in size. So surely it should be left to the... Uh, the chief executive or the people who are administering that particular hospital to make their own decisions, not have it imposed on them by central government. No one else? Thank you. Uh, now have um, Rhoda, followed by Richard. Thank you. Um, going back to e-cigarettes and um, how they compare with I think ordinary cigarettes, I think everyone is clear that they are more healthy. But a couple of um, comments. Um, some of the evidence we received, and I'm sorry, I can't remember who, who provided this, um, was that only one brand of e-cigarette has been approved as a nicotine replacement therapy, and that's not available. Is that the case? It's not actually an e-cigarette. There's a device called Voke, which is more like a nicotine. It's more like an asthma inhaler that is made by Nico Ventures, a branch of a British American tobacco that has been granted a medicinal license in the UK, but it's not yet come to market. But it's not really an e-cigarette, but that's the only one we have. There are no other, there are no uh, electronic cigarettes that are available as medicines anywhere in the world, as it, licensed medicines. It seems to me that one way around all of this, if it is so successful in dealing with um, nicotine addiction, um, then therefore it surely should be registered as a medical device. And I'm, I've always been a little concerned about the reluctance of those who are making e-cigarettes um, um, to have them registered. And I hear, you know, yes, of course, they sell better if you market them as recreational devices, but that also appeals to non-smokers if you do that. Surely if we're talking about a uh, smoking cessation and um, the addiction to nicotine, surely it would be better... Um, that they were treated totally differently rather than being uh, sold as recreational products. So, shall I start? Or? No, Andy, I think we'll, we'll, think we'll put Andy in the spot here, I think. Yeah, the, the, the main problem with medicinal regulation, apart from the cost uh, of making the companies jump through hoops to get this through all the various stages that they've got to go through, is that it is not a one-size-fits-all. You could have a medical device, but it would be about as effective as any other form of NRT, like some people get on okay with patches, some don't. If you've only got the one type of device, then it, it basically, it's just not good enough. Uh, the way electronic cigarettes work is, is because of that diversity. We need to keep the diversity, we need to, to keep the, the development of the product going forward. I mean, we started off with Cigalites just a couple of years ago, the, the little ones that look like cigarettes, and I showed you a couple of seconds ago what we're on to now. They're onto really, really powerful devices that are very, very effective, and that's been consumer-driven. I don't think that, uh, the, it, you know, if you're going to put it through a medical process to get uh, whatever, well, whatever the end process, the end product is, it's, it's just not going to be, it's not going to cut it at the end of the day. It'll do for some people, but if you keep it as a consumer product, let the consumers drive the, the, uh, the innovation, then it's working an awful lot better that way. So this is 
an issue slightly out with this bill because the European Tobacco Products Directive, which is intended to come in next spring, will introduce a two-tier system where those devices that contain more than 20 milligrams per milliliter of nicotine will have to go through down the medicinal licensing route and the other products will be allowed to remain as consumer products. So that, that already exists. It's been a very difficult journey in the UK. We recommended the, the committee that I chaired at NICE almost three years ago now that, that there be medicinal e-cigarettes. But the MHRA process is so cumbersome and complex that very few companies have been willing to put forward a device for medicines regulation, including the pharmaceutical industry, who have not been interested. So the only one that's come through is this single tobacco industry funded device. So we kind of have a system which is very complex and dis incentivizes it at the moment but then we also have European legislation which is going to make this a requirement um, so this is going to change and, and I guess this, this bill which focuses on the wider issues around e-cigarettes will just have to take into account that change in context Can I just add one Yes bit? and actually Linda knows a lot more about it than I do but I think we've got to make this leap um, away from seeing nicotine itself as harmful uh, Public Health England only in the last couple of weeks, has declared quite authoritatively that nicotine is no more harmful than caffeine. Nicotine, of course, is very closely associated with the tobacco, so people leap to this conclusion that nicotine itself is harmful. But we've got to you know, get away from that and see nicotine um, itself as, as not a bad thing, and perhaps Linda could, could add to that a bit. Well, we know a, a survey that the Royal Society for Public Health did uh, earlier this month. About 90% of non-smokers in the UK believe that nicotine is harmful and 75% of smokers believe it's harmful. Yet we provide nicotine replacement therapy to pregnant women. And the reason we've allowed that since 2005 is because nicotine, when delivered in a cleaner form, uh, is not, as Simon says, is not a harmful drug. Uh, and certainly the harm caused by tobacco is the 4,000 other chemicals in combustible tobacco, not the nicotine. So it is this tricky issue, and it probably contributes to some of the public misunderstanding about the relative risks of e-cigarettes versus tobacco cigarettes. Because as soon as people hear the word nicotine, they think that it's potentially damaging. Not, not risk-free, but certainly as an alternative tobacco, far, far safer. Mm. Yes, Rhoda, go on. I think just on that point, um, I think it's widely understood that that's the case, but nicotine's highly addictive. Surely it's not a good thing to be addicted to something. I'm not so sure that nicotine is as addictive as people are making out. It's, it's certainly addictive within cigarette smoke, but I think we're beginning to find out now that on its own, it's not that addictive. It's about as addictive as caffeine. And I've noticed that. I've, I've gone through the process of switching from tobacco to vaping. I've just come off a four and a half hour flight from Madeira and not once did I have the, the, the feeling I want to tear my hair out because I can't have a cigarette. I, I did have my vaping gear on me, but it never bothered me in the slightest that I couldn't vape on the plane. Interesting. I mean, nicotine in nicotine replacement therapy isn't dependence forming. People don't get hooked generally on NRT. You don't see people continuing to buy it or use it in large, you know, non smokers. There's about half a percent of the population in the UK who are never smokers say they use nicotine replacement therapy. If it was attractive, more would use it. But we're also seeing that with e-cigarettes. Nicotine, yes, is dependence forming, but it's primarily in tobacco it's dependence forming. And we think that it's some of the other constituents in tobacco that work with the nicotine to really hook people in the cigarette. Uh, within um, e-cigarettes, the evidence we're seeing now is that people are not as reliant on the nicotine in the e-cigarette as they are when they're smoking. Um, but again, we need longer-term studies to really understand that relationship in e-cigarettes. E yeah. I mean, I, I welcome... Andy's experience, and I think that is the experience of many people using NVPs, but we also have to recognise that cigarettes are as addictive as they are because they've been consciously engineered by tobacco companies over a number of years and with a lot of investment. And we have to recognise the strong footprint that tobacco companies have in the NVP market, which will, is likely to become stronger after the tobacco products directive regulations take effect. I suppose it, it takes us to another aspect of this in terms of the... The, the register of those who would be selling, I'll, I'll say, e-cigarettes, uh, the, 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 they would need to, again, register, I, I think, as, 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 as in the same basis as, as someone who was selling tobacco. There would be the consequences of selling 
to under 18s would be similar to selling tobacco to an under it seems a bit disproportionate if we apply the bill suggests that we should be applying the 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 the, the same sort of restrictions and penalties there doesn't it and would that be disproportionate that you know given the discussion that we just had there that we're not dealing with you know uh, as an addictive uh, 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 pr product we would like to see a, a, sep a totally separate register but i understand that that may be a costly process uh it would be uh, i've had notification from the scottish government that they were facing part of it will try to distinguish between nvps and uh tobacco we would like to see it totally separate but if it's not possible then any other views on that that I've, I've certainly made it very clear that I don't think it should be the same register. I can see that the idea of a register is useful for enforcing, uh, giving trading standards a tool to enforce the underage sales issue, which we've all agreed is important. But I don't think it should be the same register as tobacco, and certainly it shouldn't be presented as the same register because they're not the same products. We, we need to do much more to get rid of tobacco from Scottish society and, and definitely not focus on trying to get rid of e-cigarettes because they potentially will save lives for some people. Sheila? I think there have been two advantages to having a register of those retailing tobacco and one is that enforcement officers know who's selling it where and can engage and educate and the other is that we can, um, it's access for academics to see how things change. Now this is a very fluid emerging changing market and I think that data would be very helpful but I, I agree with the points that, that Linda and Andy have made that for it to look different it, when a retailer is going into register may help just to distinguish the products. Richard Simpson. Yes, the Rule 8 in the Advertising Standards Association is marketing communications must not encourage non-smokers or non-nicotine users to use e-cigarettes. So, you know, if they're so safe, if they're completely harmless, then, you know, why have we got that restriction? Why are we putting any restrictions on this at all? I mean, it seems to me, you know, that we need to recognise the cultural history of cigarettes. That You know, they started off as... Um, something that was, apart from King James, you know, was thought to be uh, very reasonable and was promoted as improving health. And, you know, my father as a GP who smoked, you know, said it was good for the lungs, you know, and encouraged the lungs to exercise. We've been through this once. You know, this is a very new area. We really don't know. And I do understand that there are some studies in the States already suggesting that the consumption of nicotine by this method, not by patches or other methods, but by this method, is not entirely free from harm. And I wonder if Linda could tell us if there's any research on that, but also if the others could comment on uh, whether we sh this is a reasonable restriction. And I suppose my last bit on the restrictions is, should the advertising within a certain distance of schools be actually banned in order to not encourage youngsters to take this up? The reason why I welcome some restrictions on advertising is precisely for that. There are no good reasons why a never-smoking child should start using these products, and we all actually agree on that point. Because, you know, nicotine may still is still dependence-forming. Certainly it is in cigarettes. The other aspect, of course, is an inequalities one, Richard, is, you know, why should kids spend their money on these devices if they don't need them? So we do have to protect children from uptake. Um, and I think that's why some of these, adver you know, the idea around restricting advertising is important. What will happen in the future and how they evolve? Uh, so, uh, Sheila's already highlighted that. I agree. There's a range of questions. So I think what we're seeing here is an attempt to balance risk and benefit, not prohibit current smokers from accessing these products, and in fact potentially encourage that, but also try and keep an eye on the protection responsibility that we have. Says it all for me. It's proportionate to risk. The question is what the risk is. We just don't know, do we? Yeah. Do we know? Well, I mean, it's so new. Do we actually? Are there any studies at all on on, on the harm? Yeah, I mean, you you will know the types of research, um, Richard, that we have. The lab-based studies that have tried to look at the constituents in e-cigarettes. What you find is that the we, they don't have these tobacco-specific nitrosamines that you know are carcinogenic, but they do have very low levels of some of the harmful toxins that we've seen in tobacco, like lead and cadmium, um, <coughs> acetaldehyde, but at very, very low levels. So I'm not saying they're risk-free, but they're certainly far, far less harmful than tobacco. I think we can be relatively confident about
about that. There are questions about going on in detail about, as you know, long-term use, uh, inhalation into the lungs, long-term exposure. Uh, we know about propylene glycol, but we maybe don't know about some of the other no. constituents. But these are more research questions. I think if we are too restrictive, we potentially miss a public health prize, which is people switching. Uh, but I agree, it's not straightforward. So we need some, we need good research, really. The, the, the last say, bit of my saying. question, Chair. Oh, sorry. Hold that a wee bit, because yeah. you know, Linda mentioned uh, earlier that what's the difference, she explained to me, that women, you, of giving a nicotine patch to a pregnant woman than, than using the uh, an e cigarette? Yep. Right. Yes, I'm, 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 I'm not supposed Richard to Richard will correct me if I'm wrong as the <laughs> clinician and one of the clinicians in the room. Um, basically, it's pharmaceutical grade nicotine in the nicotine patch. Um, it's, uh, the, the method of delivery has been rigorously tested in terms of safety and efficacy. The difference with e-cigarettes, if, if we leave aside the nicotine, which I don't think we really need to worry about in e-cigarettes, it's the other constituents in the e-cigarettes and the way that it's the uh, device delivers nicotine to the body that may have some risks. We're not seeing really any evidence of that at the moment. But there's propylene glycol, there's flavorings that you will have heard of, and the yes. flavorings have a number of constituents. So I do think Rich is right. There are longer-term questions about potentially the impact of use. But when the contrast is with smoking, where, where we know so clearly what the harm is, I, I do believe we can be confident about far lower risk. Sheila. Um, I, I think uh, Rich is absolutely right. We do not have good long-term knowledge yet about the effects of NVP products. And I think there are some concerns when you are taking things in through the lungs as opposed to through the skin or through the stomach. It's a slightly different agency. And um, I think... To me, these things are fairly obviously not as dangerous as tobacco, but as we've said, that doesn't make them completely safe. And there have been one or two flavourings that there have been immediate risks attached to, such as uh, sort of uh, butterscotch, uh, dacetals and cinnamon, and particularly when you heat them at high temperatures, which is another factor that's coming in. So I think this is probably one to watch very carefully, but agree with Linda that tobacco is undoubtedly dangerous, incredibly dangerous. And that is something that we have to keep our eyes on throughout this. How does it impact on tobacco use? Can I just... I think, I think yeah, Andy's right. going to respond yeah. to that as well. That's just uh, with, with, know, reference, with reference to the flavourings problems, the consumers are actually dealing with, with these kind of problems as they happen. As soon as a, a problem is identified, that stuff gets off the market straight away and it's replaced with something that's, that's more acceptable. A lot more acceptable. So yeah, I mean the risk is probably 95% less. There, there is room for improvement, uh, but again, the devices are improving as we go along. We've now got heat protection in the devices, and that you can't heat it to the temperature that's going to start producing uh, formaldehydes and so forth. So with it still being a consumer-driven product, we are addressing these problems as we go along. Uh, I dare say there will be other problems that will come up, but it's certainly not going to be anywhere near the, the scale of the problems caused by smoking combustible tobacco. Is there anything, I mean, one of the things that concerns me is, is the tobacco industry are buying up VPNs. Now, they're not doing it for the good of our souls. They're doing it from, on a profit-based motive, and good luck to them in that, and then it's, that's their, their job. But what's to stop them actually putting in the back end the additives that previously addicted people strongly. You know, given that we're saying that nicotine consumed by this method as others is maybe less addictive than uh, tobacco, what is to stop them actually creating the market, strengthening their market by adding in some of the additives that they've added in before, which are so damaging? <clears throat> I, I absolutely agree with you. They will be, they are very effective at getting around whatever restrictions are put in their way, um, and they have uh, huge resources behind them. The European Tobacco Products Directive is requiring both for the consumer product, uh, for the consumer product primarily, not the medicinal product, which will have to go through the licensing route, 
for contents to be clearly described um, for the development of the devices and how you know what the different constituents in them are to be lab more clearly labelled. And it's actually a very complex document what they're going to have to declare. Now, whether that will deal adequately with that issue or not, I don't know. But that is part of the, your, the EU TPD. Thank you. Anyone else, Andy? Yeah, I can also tell you that the tobacco industry products are useless. They are absolutely hopeless. No seasoned vapour would bother with the tobacco uh, company products that, that they're putting on in the market at the moment. They're just, they just don't cut the ice, so to speak. They're useless. And maybe that's deliberate. I don't know. Could well be deliberate from the tobacco company's point of view. They don't want them to work. So, generally speaking, uh, anyone that knows enough about vaping will not buy one of these tobacco products, and, and they're few and far between, to tell you the truth. Well, Sheila. I, I, Sheila's I, going to respond as well. Yes. There you go. So you give them a chance, they will respond. <laughs> yeah, I share Andy's concern that tobacco companies may consciously try to dominate the market and that their products are likely to be less effective in delivering what people want and that they will be trying to encourage dual use rather than cessation because they make more profit from combustible tobacco products. Anyone else? Well, I'm not here, as you know, to represent the tobacco industry, but I think that's a load of nonsense that they're going to produce a product that nobody wants. What a load of nonsense. I mean, look at it this way. The tobacco companies have a lot of money to put into research and development. E-cigarettes will get better and better. And looking at it from the outside, I would have thought that nobody's in a better position to pour money into research and development than the large tobacco companies. But so I'm not here to defend them. Going back to Richard's initial point, I just wanted to say that the implication of what he was saying is that we should live in a risk-free world. Well, we don't live in a risk-free world. I think the important thing is to give the consumer as much information as, uh, as possible about the health risks of tobacco, the health risks of using e-cigarettes or any other consumer product. Ultimately, it comes down to a word that uh, Linda used a bit earlier, choice. Let the consumer make their choice based on an informed choice, based on all the available information. It's their choice. It shouldn't be the choice of politicians to decide how they're going to live their lives. That's us told. Um, <laughs> we've got Dennis now, please. Um, as a politician who's concerned about health and well-being, um, of everyone in our society. Do you think this bill strikes the balance? Um, for instance, do we have within the bill enough there for the exemptions to be um, flexible enough, say within health boards, to have areas designated as potentially maybe a smoking area? Because it is seen as um, it is the preferred route for that person's health and well-being, albeit maybe going through a cessation program or whatever, but maybe due to mental illness, psychiatric conditions, whatever, um, it is felt that we need those specific areas within the health boards. And do you think the enforcement aspect that we're talking about is proportionate? I, you know, I, I seem to think that perhaps sometimes enforcing. Um, can be overzealous. I um, just wonder if you have any points with reference to the bill, taking on the professor's uh, aspect of policy enforcement and information. Professor, maybe you would like to start. I mean, I, I guess I, I feel more strongly about the e-cigarette elements of this legislation and feel more able to speak to the evidence on that yeah. than the hospital grounds issue, which I said earlier, I think is a tricky, complex issue. Yeah. Um, I do think the way this... Uh, I think the principle of a smoke-free area around a hospital is very important and the power to enforce that uh, in an effective way, which is what this bill tries to do, is very important. But just to state again that I think drafting the regulations of this aspect is going to be really the crucial thing to get that balance. Right. Yeah, complex, yeah. But do you feel that in the interest of a person's overall health and well-being, if it's if there's a uh, it is determined that it, that the, the the patient should be uh, permitted to continue to smoke, there should be a, a designated area, and mainly within the I'm talking about you know significant uh, mental health or psychiatric conditions. I can't, 
I can't see that it would ever be able to be argued that smoking tobacco is in the interest of anyone's health. Mm. I think we need to look at what that smoking is doing for that person and what can be offered. And it may be, for example, in cases of mental health issues, that some form of NVP could be an acceptable alternative, as it has been for a number of smokers. With respect, we're talking about um, well-being rather than health, and a lot of patients' immediate well-being may actually be helped by being allowed to have a cigarette outside a psychiatric hospital or a standard NHS hospital. And I I can't repeat myself enough, I think it's uh, petty, vindictive and inhumane to say to people, no, you cannot have a cigarette anywhere on hospital grounds. That's totally and utterly wrong. And that's where I think the bill does go too far. Do you, what about the, with regard to enforcement? Do you think we would have the appropriate guidance and information to enable enforcement officers to carry out, um, a, I suppose, their duties within, so that will continue in the hospital grounds? Well, the problem is, in terms of enforcement, A, it's going to cost money. You maybe have to employ tobacco control wardens. Uh, you may have to put in CCTV cameras. Uh, I mean, we've even heard of some hospitals putting in a sound system so that if the CCTV camera catches somebody lighting up in the bushes, a big voice comes out of the ether and says, put that cigarette out. I mean, this is a ridiculous way, surely, to, to run a hospital. Surely hospitals have far better things to do. And we did a recent poll through uh, Populous, and we asked people what their priorities were for hospitals. And I have to say, tackling smoking uh, came last in a list of ten uh, issues. There were other issues that were far more important to the public, like reducing A&E uh, waiting times and general waiting times, uh, you know, having more doctors and nurses. These are far more important issues than whether somebody uh, lights a cigarette on mm. hospital grounds. Mm. And just on, the other thing on enforcement is that if this is made a statutory offence and somebody tries to stop somebody smoking on hospital grounds, what are they going to do? Are they going to... I mean, if it's a visitor, you can order them off the premises. If it's a, a patient, what, what's going to happen? Uh, are they going to be ordered off the premises, or are they going to be manhandled? We have to get, we're getting into very difficult areas here. If you try and stop, physically stop somebody smoking on hospital grounds, that could be seen as assault. So let's be careful. We're going down a very dangerous route here. Just boards in Scotland have unanimously taken the decision already to make their grounds uh, smoke-free in line with the, the Scottish Government's last tobacco control strategy, which had that as, as an objective within it. I think this bill tries to provide the basis for actually enforcing that. In other words, giving that voluntary decision that they've taken uh, teeth. Um, and, and that's my understanding of, of what the, the spirit of this is. Um, if it proceeds, there are a number of countries, other countries other than the UK, who've done, who've successfully implemented smoke-free hospital grounds, and I think there's potentially a great deal that we could learn from them. Good. What, what are those countries that you... Uh, well, both prisons and hospitals, Canada is a good example to look at. Uh, some states in Australia or other places, and also parts of Scandinavia where you see good examples of... Uh, uh, smoke-free hospitals okay. and grants. Sheila, did you want to come in? Uh, just briefly to say that uh, YouGov polling that we um, commissioned last year showed that 73% of Scottish adults supported the proposal that smoking uh, should end in hospital grounds. No one else. Richard Lyle. Yes. Can I, can I come back and, and Mr Clark, can you stay back on this one? I'd like the other three witnesses to, to come in. Can we get real on this bill? You know, at the end of the day, yes, I, I agree that smoking outside a hospital shouldn't, people shouldn't do it, and they shouldn't litter the place, they shouldn't crowd, and, and, and sometimes actually you have to, at four o'clock, try to get in to, to visit a loved one, you're trying to get by people who are standing there puffing away. But can I say that there may be a flaw or, or an opportunity in this bill? The Scottish Government writes in policy memorandum to the bill that has chosen the option that it will ban smoking around buildings, but would allow exceptions to the ban to be made in regulations. It states that this option complements existing smoke-free policies which will take a balanced, more realistic, more compassionate and safe approach. I'm a smoker. I agree that people shouldn't smoke outside the hospital. 
But should we not make it the point that Mr Clark was, has been quite forceful on, and, and the point I'm trying to make is maybe a 100-yard, 200-yard radius within the hospital uh, entrance, that um, people should be able to smoke there. Now, if I go into Wisher car park, uh, the hospital in the car park, I, I can sit... My wife doesn't want me to do this, by the way, and I don't do it now. Um, I can smoke my car. You can't do anything about that. And I'm maybe... I, I'm within the, the cartilage of the... Of the um, the, the hospital grounds. I'm in the hospital grounds. But I'm in my own car. So we won't even go there. But the point is, should it not be that we say within a 100-yard, 200-yard or 300-yard radius, and the point you made earlier on, Professor, all these notices are up in, in hospital grounds and now, don't smoke, they're totally ignored. What I want is to have a situation on both sides that we respect people who still want to smoke, but we respect that people who don't want to smoke, and, and in order to ensure that people don't crowd a, an entrance, that people should respect that and move away from the entrance, have a designated area, don't even put up, don't spend money to put up a shelter, by the way, <coughs> but have a, a designated area that people can exercise Let's be honest about it. Their human right to do as they wish to have a cigarette. And I'd like the three other three witnesses apart from I know what Mr. Clark would come back and say and say it for half an hour. I've I've went on long enough. Can I ask the three witnesses? Enforcement. Should should, should we not have a two hundred yard radius and let people that. smoke? Oh, I mean, the call for smoke-free hospital grounds and the policy for smoke-free hospital grounds didn't come from my organisation, Ash Scotland. It came from clinicians and hospitals who I think have seen the pain caused to people's lives and people's families by diseases caused by tobacco. So I think the magnitude of this epidemic, which is responsible for the early deaths of some 13,000 adults in Scotland every year, shouldn't be underestimated. Um, to me, it seems that the enforcement in a defined perimeter will address some of the concerns that you've raised and is a good starting point. I suppose the danger in creating areas for smoking is that you are seen to be acknowledging and permitting something that is so damaging to people's lives. But Anyone else? The... Richards? Anyone else? I'd what? rather not talk about smoking, yeah. quite well. honest. You know, again, I have to get real. One, one in three people have cancer or get cancer. And a lot of people, I, as I said to you earlier, that's smoke. You know, um, but I've had a lot of friends who have died with cancer that have never smoked. You know, we, we, we honestly, I, I want to see this bill work. I want to ensure that what's happening in hospitals doesn't. But we have to get real. You know, why bring in something that, you know, if I walk down Socky Hall Street and I drop my cigarette in, I can face a £60 fine. I think it's up to £80 now. I'm not sure. Right? I accept that. But if I'm going to a hospital to see a, a loved one or whatever, and, and we see it, people could... We see people... I've I, I seen it during the time that I worked with the NHS out of our service for two and a half years and saw people come out of that hospital crying. <clears throat> the loved one had just died... And the first thing they did was they opened a cigarette packet and shaking and having a, a cigarette to calm themselves down. Now, if we're going to turn around and say we're anti-smokers, well, let's do away with smoking. Let's, let's lose the, the, the millions of pounds that people get, the, the government gets in tax, right? If you want to do away with smoking, do away with smoking, right? But we have to get real. We have to convince people. We convince people not to smoke inside premises because it's harmful. People now accept that. We've got well, to... Well, well, we need to get to the question, Richard. Yeah, well, I mean, we've the got question, to... The question, the question it seems to be focusing on is enforcement. We've, we already have health board policy that has been ignored. We have public revulsion of not just 
clinicians who are treating people as a consequence of many times of a lifetime of smoking, but we have got revulsion in people visiting the hospital and having to go through a gauntlet of people smoking in the entrances to our hospital. That's what my case work reflects. Um, uh, you know, so we've got a government bill that seeks to do that. You know, do we do we need to? You know, are we going too far to 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 find people in hospital grounds who are or uh, who 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 smoke in hospital grounds or in areas where they're they're clearly not allowed to? Should we be finding them on the spot? Or? But just to come back to the point I made earlier, there's no point in having these current restrictions if they're not if they don't work. I mean, it makes a mockery of the time, money and effort spent in the signage and everything else. And the spirit, as Sheila said, that the reason the push for this has come from clinicians and others who do not want that big group of people around the build, the periphery of the building, the litter, all the other things associated with that. So by saying let's have at least some of the grounds covered by a smoke-free policy um, that's enforceable and has penalties associated with it, we can successfully implement that. So I think that's the spirit of it. But the point I would make is the detail of how big that perimeter is and exactly um, what that involves is an issue for the regulations, and I don't think it's straightforward. And a, the, the other side, Richard, of this, as I notice in hospitals, just as I see sometimes with pubs and clubs, that people are outside the building but not stop smoking. And I see staff members now out on the street, outside the hospital perimeter, having a cigarette before they go into work. And, and I'm coming back to that question about actually dealing with this, and I wonder, you mentioned earlier, as well as the punitive measures that they have, because those staff certainly face punitive action if they smoke on ground. They can be disciplined, they can be sacked, dismissed, etc. But about that gap that you mentioned about... Uh, uh, the, about the support that health boards give to staff members and indeed uh, patients who may be in for a short or medium term about how, uh, what alternatives can be given to them and supported in them when they have uh, uh, an addiction. So we have NICE guidance, which doesn't directly apply to Scotland, on smoking cessation in acute mental health and maternity hospitals. And my understanding is the pathway that recommends is not widely implemented in Scotland. So there's much more we could do to give people other products, like nicotine-containing products, to help them deal with withdrawal and, and use those if they want when they're going outside as well. Those are licensed products. Much more we could do. Um, but I also think, importantly, there is a place for NVPs in this as well. We shouldn't, and that's why it's so important not to ban nicotine e-cigarette use in NHS grounds, because an alternative for a staff member, of course, is not just a nicotine patch, it's an e-cigarette as well. Um, so I do think those alternatives and that support are really crucial. Okay. Have we any other questions for our witnesses this morning? Mike? Thank you, Convener. I was hoping to get to this point earlier. Um, and it seems to me to be fundamental to the question that the legislation is trying to address. Um, is there any evidence to suggest that passive smoking in the open air presents a tangible health risk? Can I come in? No, sorry, go on, Linda. Yeah, I mean, there, not, not if you're far away from the smoker, it doesn't. If you're, if you're very close proximity to the smoker, you're going to get that side stream drift the way as you would indoors. And that's why, you know, we don't want any environments, including some outdoor environments, where people are close to smokers and can be impacted by that side stream drift, which is important. Yeah. I must go, I'm, I'm not aware that there's any evidence that lighting up in the open air is harmful to anybody, even if you're standing quite close to them, because uh, as soon as you light up in the open air, it's massively diluted. Uh, even, a, uh, you know, even a tiny little bit of wind is going to blow it away. I do think people are now very, very precious about walking past somebody in the street if they're smoking a cigarette. Quite often, it's not the smoke that's bothering them, it's the smell. We can't go around banning things because we don't like the smell of it. But what's happened, I think, since the smoking ban came in is that people are now very sensitive to even a, a whiff of smoke in a way that they weren't before because they were used to it. So now... You know, uh, people sort of complain if they have to they run the gauntlet of going past smokers outside hospitals. I agree with Richard. I think basically we shouldn't have people smoking directly outside the entrance to a hospital. But when people 
use terms like running the gauntlet of people smoking outside, I don't know what world they're living in. I'm a non-smoker. I've never smoked. And honestly, in my average day now, I can't, I can't think of when I'm actually exposed to somebody lighting a cigarette in the open air. If I'm walking down the street, I'm not even aware that they're smoking. Or if I was, I could just move around them. It's complete and utter nonsense. As long as you're on your feet and you're mobile then I really don't see what the problem is. I understand why smoking is banned in outdoor stadiums, because if you're in a seat and you can't move, then yes, even if you're in the open air, you're, it's not very pleasant being stuck right next to somebody who's smoking. And that would actually go for vaping as well, blowing clouds of vapour into your face. But if you're in an open concourse on a but sports stadium, you can I th- move. I think, I think we're getting the point, Mr Clark. Sheila, do you want to contribute to this? Um, there is... I mean, I don't think exposure to tobacco smoke would be the main argument in this case. There are limited examples where you don't have airflow, where you've got open windows and smoke is drifting in, where it could be a concern. Okay. One point on that, because I've heard the argument used quite a lot, smoke drifting in through windows. Well, I've not been in a hospital ward where somebody's been smoking outside. I have been in a hotel and people have been standing outside smoking. And I tell you, it's not smoke drifting into my window that's the problem. It's them chatting too loudly so you can't get to sleep. The idea that smoke is drifting into people's windows when they're smoking outside, I'm sorry, again, this is just hyperbole. Yeah, it does upset some people. Going back to my case, yeah. one of the, you know, the, 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 child, the sick kids of uh, the hospital in Glasgow, people uh, outside there were children very seriously ill. Smoking below the window, they might be chatting as well, and smoke getting in the window. I have a you know, casework that represented that. So people are affected at different levels. I just throw that in as There are know, studies. Example. I mean, um, I agree with Sheila that the, the main rationale for that is not around health harm from, from secondhand smoke in outdoor areas. But there are definitely studies that look at, for example, drift of smoke between um, an, um, um, an outdoor smoking area and an outdoor eating area, where they, they have been able to measure whether people are exposed to that when they're in close proximity to the outdoor smoking area. So there is some data. It does happen. But the main arguments are not so much the health harm arguments, but the other arguments around taking tobacco out of society, less visibility, uh, children's exposure, etc. Beer gardens, one of the things that has been researched in Australia. Yeah, that's right. Um, and I think also anyone who walks from Waverley has to go through a cloud of smoke within 20 yards of the, of the Waverley station every morning when you come down from Parliament. If you're an asthmatic... I have to say, Mr. Clark, then I think it isn't the smell, it is actually the smoke that actually causes, causes problems. So I think that, uh, you know, that the, your, your arguments are, are overly strong, I, I think. Mike? Yeah, I just wondered then, and just to tease out this uh, area, um, that, yes, and I can accept that in certain circumstances there will be a health argument to be made about passive smoking if it's concentrated. I just wonder though if there's been an analysis, I mean Dr Simpson mentions walking down from Waverley Station and vehicles have been largely excluded Mm. from Waverley Mm. Station because of the the air quality and air quality is a problem in Edinburgh generally and what I'm interested in is is a a scientific risk based uh, approach to this so what, and perhaps uh, um, Sheila Duffy can answer this, um, in terms of uh, your concerns about the risks to health through passive smoking in open air, how does that compare with the health risk due to poor air quality in a lot of our cities as a result of traffic fumes? So that we can get a sense of proportion uh, over this issue. Right. Well, I would say there are specific examples, for example, Victoria Hospital, where the windows tilted and people smoking directly outside by the building, the smoke was going into the maternity ward. If you're asking me about vehicle pollution, there is a study I'm aware of. I would have to look up the details and send it to the committee. But there is a study that, that, com- that compares vehicle exhaust with tobacco smoke. That would and be very interesting. No. Good. I mean, the, 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 bill, the, the, the bill, of course, doesn't propose to ban smoking in, in open public uh, areas that stop short of any of that. Not yet, I hear from the hecklers beside me, but we'll, we'll, we'll see what a revisionism got on this morning. Um, 
Uh, we, if we've got no other questions from the, from the committee, can I extend the committee's thank to you, thanks for your attendance here this morning, the whole time you've given, and uh, um, the oral and written evidence that we've received. Thank you very, very much indeed. Um, we're suspending at this point, and as previously decided, we will be going into private session. With the exclusion of Richard Simpson, who has got a, he can stay for the first bat. So I think we're no the first two, is it?